Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar proudly hosted by UTS Business School. My name is Professor Carl Rhodes and it's my pleasure to be the convener of the panel. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. UTS Business School, where I speak from you right now, is on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, a land that was never ceded. The Gadigal people have cared for their community, land and waters for thousands of generations based on their deep knowledge of their country. I'd like to pay respects to their ancestors, their elders, and acknowledge their ongoing status as the first peoples of this land. Now, just to begin with a few house rules, uh, today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available as a download soon by email, by various UTS social media channels, including the UTS YouTube channel, um, and that should all be sometime early next week. Uh, to minimize any technical interruptions or distractions, we've deactivated your cameras and microphones. Um, but I do encourage you to submit any panel questions or comments in the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. We'll try to get as many questions, uh, get to as many questions as possible. And uh, thanks to those who submitted questions when registering for today. Now, we are joined today by a highly distinguished and experienced panel to discuss the questions, the question, Women are just as good, if not better, leaders than men. So why aren't more women in leadership roles? Now, before we get to the panel, I'll just make a few opening remarks. Now, one of the most remarkable features of today's question is how long it's been around. It feels shameful that we live in a society that's long recognized the fundamental injustice that privileges men when it comes to taking leadership roles, but at the same time has failed to effectively resolve it. We of course need to recognize the achievements of the many women who have and do serve, for example, as the world's leaders. We can think of Cory Aquino, Benazir Bhutto, Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, Angela Merkel, Julia Gillard, and Jacinta Ardern. To suggest that women are not capable of leadership at the highest level is ignorant and prejudicial. But to say that women are in the vast minority is an absolute fact. If we look a little closer to home in Australian business, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency reports that while women make up half of the workforce, they occupy, occupy less than a third of key management positions. Just last year in 2020, there were 25 newly appointed CEOs in Australia. Only one of them was a woman. All of this contributes to the gender pay gap in Australia of 21%. Now, it's even worse for women of color. 97% of Australian chief executives come from Anglo-Celtic or European backgrounds. A simple and woefully false explanation would be to assume that women are not as good as men at business leadership, and so they simply don't rise to the top. All evidence proves otherwise, with research showing, for example, that companies with female chief executives and chief financial officers perform better than those with men in those positions. To suggest, to suggest that nothing can be done is also wrong. Much of what's been achieved, for example, by the work of people on this panel through the Diversity Council of Australia, the Champions of Change, the Australian Institute of Company Directors and Chief Executive Women Australia shows that things really can be done. So why are there so few senior women leaders? To consider this question, let me introduce you to our panel. In alphabetical order, um, uh, we have Liz Broderick, who's principal of uh, Elizabeth Broderick and Company and chair rapporteur of the United Nations Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. Liz was a 2016 New South Wales Australian of the Year and Australia's longest serving sex discrimination officer. Welcome, Liz. Stuart Irvine is chief executive officer of Lion. He also chairs the Business Council Australia's Governance and Citizenship Committee and is founder member of the B-Team Climate Leaders Coalition in Australasia. Stuart is a dedicated public supporter of the role of corporate, that corporations play in delivering value for society. Welcome, Stuart. Uh, next, we have Kevin McCann, who's chairman of Telex Pharmaceuticals, a trustee of the Sydney Opera House, a foundation member of the Champions of Change, former chairman of Macquarie Group and Origin Energy, Last year, Kevin became an officer of the Order of Australia for distinguished service to business, corporate governance, and advocacy for gender equity. Welcome, Kevin. 
Nikki Sparshot is Chief Executive Officer of Unilever ANZ and Global T2. Nikki has 24 years of experience in leading global corporations in consumer goods, retail, luxury, and e-commerce. Nikki's the Board Director of the World Wildlife Fund Australia and NED of Global Sisters. She is a passionate advocate that businesses should play a key role in building a more equitable and inclusive society. Welcome, Nikki. Deanne Stewart is Chief Executive Officer of Aware Super, one of Australia's largest super funds. Deanne was previously CEO of MetLife Australia and held executive roles at BT Financial Group and Merrill Lynch. Deanne is also a workplace gender equality agency pay equity ambassador. Welcome, Deanne. And last in our alphabetical list, Professor Noreen Young leads the Indigenous People and Work Research and Practice Hub at UTS's Jambana Institute. Noreen is one of Australia's most respected workplace diversity practitioners, thinkers, and influencers. She was formerly director of Pricewaterhouse Coopers Indigenous Consulting, chief executive of the Diversity Council Australia, and director of the New South Wales Women's Centre. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our panel. So we're going to start straight into asking some of the questions. And I might start, Liz, with you. I mean, the premise of this discussion is that women are just as good, if not better leaders than men. Do you think that's the case? Or is it that women are different to men as leaders? I mean, are we in danger here of judging women by stand standards that are set by and for men? Thanks very much, Carl. And kind of yes, yes, and yes. Um, but to go into that in more detail and to first off say that um, I'm so looking forward to our discussion today. Um, I'm joining you also from Indigenous lands. I'm on the lands of a Watamalagal clan. So the first peoples of this land in Hunters Hill here in Sydney, land that has never been ceded. So I just want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners um, and their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and to pay my respects. Uh, I also just want to start also by acknowledging that as a pandemic rages across the world and inequality is growing, I just think it's so timely to have a conversation like this. Um, and in starting that, and I suppose in recognition of the work that I'm doing globally through my UN role, I do want to acknowledge the loss of life and livelihoods and very much the loss of hope in so many nations of the world and particularly amongst the most marginalized in all our communities. Because as we will discuss today, um, you know, the less power you have, the more deeply and negatively this pandemic is impacting on you. But today we're asking are women just as good, if not better leaders than men? And I, I, I try to stay away from generalities, I suppose in the work that I do, I try to make sure that it's evidence-based and also to make the point that, you know, gender equality is not a zero sum game. It's about lifting everybody. But there's no question that there's many, many reports which point to the strength of women's leadership capability. And I thought I might just start by looking at one example, and that is women's, how, how are female leaders faring during COVID? And there I'm talking about nation state leaders. And it was interesting, I, I don't know if some of you um, may have read an article which was published in The Lancet just a few weeks ago, which looked at 35 countries and how they're faring during COVID. Um, and what they found conclusively in The Lancet, a very um, evidence-based publication, they found that countries led by female leaders have fared significantly better during the pandemic than those that are led by men. In fact, the three best standouts in um, at the minute in terms of uh, national performance were Taiwan, New Zealand and Iceland and what they have in common. One of the things they have in common is that they all have female leaders. Um, and in the um, article also looking at the three worst performers, the USA, Brazil and UK, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to determine what they all have in common there. But interestingly, the researchers noted that there was a set of correlations. They said that countries led by women experienced much fewer COVID-19 deaths per capita, and they were more effective and rapid at flat, flattening the epidemic's curve, particularly with lower peaks in daily deaths. And when they interrogated as to why this might be the case, they found that most women-led governments, firstly, they listened to the science. 
Secondly, they prioritise public health over economic concerns, although they saw the strong link between loss of life and loss of livelihoods. They also determined that female leaders were more successful at eliciting collaboration from the, their populations, their citizenry. Um, and they found that, that finally, that, that um, countries led by women have a stronger focus on social equality, human needs and generosity. They place social and environmental well-being at the core of national policy making. Now, I was kind of reflecting on that and saying, well, why would any of us be surprised? Because I wasn't certainly surprised. But I think coming back to our discussion today, um, it is some of the differences in the way women lead. Um, and I'm also saying that men can lead in this way as well, but it requires both feminine and masculine energy. It requires the ability to be vulnerable, compassionate, listening, the ability to build bridges of understanding in a much more polar, polarized world. And often it's these types of skills that are more correlated with women's leadership than with men's leadership. So I do believe um, that, you know, leadership across the world and in all the work that I'm seeing in many, many nations, it has a very masculine face in 2021. And it's not that style of leadership which is going to enable us to solve some of the most complex and pro pressing problems facing the world. So just in closing, I just want to add, there is one real bright spot in terms of women's leadership across the world today. It's not nor all negative um, news. And I think that's about the rise of feminist organisations, and particularly non-government organisations all across the world. Because what we're witnessing at the minute is new and creative forms of civil um, and civic participation and action, particularly with young women. They're shunning traditional notions of leadership and power, um, and they're leading in different ways of powerful agents of change. I'm talking there about the new movements that we're seeing across the globe calling for equality, democracy, economic and climate justice. And I'm thinking about what was just last month in Argentina, around women's reproductive rights. Argentina will now have the most progressive legislation across the LAC region, Latin America and the Caribbean. I'm talking about all the women who are marching on the street in Poland, um, particularly around the constitutional court's ruling on an abolition on abortion. I'm thinking about the way they are linking issues such as violence against women to other movements, including workers' rights and reproductive rights and just the way they are calling for um, accountability and action for the protection of their own communities and the world that we all share together. So I believe women's activism, young women's activism in particular, is, and their leadership is a really strong ray of light in a pretty dim world. Thanks very much, Carl. Look, thanks so much, Liz. I mean, that's a really you know, insightful comment in a sense on women's leadership being different um, uh, and then the, you know the current uh, terrible example of COVID showing cases in which case clearly uh, more effective. So just following up from, on that Noreen, um, so if this is the case, why is it that so few women do progress through the corporate and political ranks to the top? I mean in your experience with diversity what do you see as the barriers to women leading major corporate organizations and uh, countries and political institutions? Thanks, Carl, and I too want to acknowledge that um, I'm working today from Gadigal land. I'm an Eora descendant, and I want to acknowledge my ancestors, elders, um, past, present and emergent, and acknowledge that um, this land sovereignty was never ceded and that we are only, um, is it two days away from Invasion Day that brings with it so much sadness and so much grief for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and descendants of those communities. And um, for I think our country um, more generally and so much is, is lacking in resolution for us and there's so much still to do. Um, I, I think what it despite, I think I agree with Liz on, on the question. I think that we're way beyond talking about better and where we are is talking about different. I think it's clear that in this country, um, 
the a lot of men and not you know here we go not all men but a lot of men are simply not prepared to give up the power and it's the culture of institutions and workplaces that is what's important obviously as a descendant of aboriginal people i'm going to take the black feminist position here and say that in corporate and mainstream feminism not much has been ceded to women of colour either. And that's really problematic. And I think that given the worldwide movements that Liz is talking about, um, it's time for Australian feminism to take a good, long, hard look at itself. I don't know if anyone else um, has seen the recent movie around the beginning of the, um, the second wave women's movement in Australia and Aboriginal women have been fighting around um, the pla their place in, femi in Australian feminism for a long time. And I think we're seeing women of colour more generally um, be more assertive. And so I think it's a, it's a combination of things around um, women of colour in particular, that there has to be consideration and thought given among corporate and, and mainstream feminists to the position of women of colour and um, women from cowled background in this country. We're not other, we are in fact the mainstream and that movement has to occur and um, those men in power have to um, give up some of that power and also thinking of, uh, about um, the culture of workplaces and institutions more generally. As you know, um, Jumbunna released a report on the workplace experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people last year called Gariella. Um, casual and appearance racism is still absolutely rife. When we're still dealing with issues as base as that, how do you advance? Um, so I think there are still a lot of issues to be dealt with. Look, thanks so much, Noreen. I mean, obviously, uh, central points to this discussion. I and mean, we might just continue talking about um, uh, not just women leadership, but specific issues related to women of colour. And the appointment of uh, Kamala Harris as Vice President of the United States has been hailed by many as a breakthrough uh, for women of colour. Um, uh, and as, as you say, who are even more uh, underrepresented, indeed vastly underrepresented compared to white women in countries like uh, the United States where she is and, and here in Australia. I mean, Kevin, in, in your experience, what, do you di uh, what difference do you think Harris's appointment will make for women with a diversity of uh, ethnicity and uh, class and other backgrounds? I think you're muted, Kevin. Is that better? We got it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you've picked the perfect day because the New York Times has an article called Proudly Diverse Australia is still run by people who are white. Um, so I, I commend that article to you all. Um, uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris is really uh, an interesting case, isn't she? Because she's the daughter of two immigrants, uh, a, a man from uh, the Caribbean who presumably was African-American and uh, a, a, a woman who was Indian. Um, perhaps I could re reframe the colour point. I think we, we, I'd like to not only include uh, Indigenous people and, and people from Africa and India, but also uh, our Asian uh, Asian population, which which uh, is really remarkable. I suppose there's, there's some background I'd just make is that, firstly, Australia is overwhelmingly white. 75% um, uh, of Australians are English, Irish or Scots, or call themselves Australians. And then when you add other Europeans like Greeks, Italians, Germans and East, uh, East Europeans, you're probably up around the 90s. And so you've got, you've got the indigenous population 3.3%. And now very interestingly there, one third of that population is under 15 and the median age of the population is 21. Um, so in terms of, of pipeline, we have an issue and I'll come back to that. And 3.1% and, uh, are Chinese um, heritage and 1.4% are Indian. Uh, and 
but there are also other Asian, Asian groups, uh, particularly uh, Vietnamese. Um, I think one of the, one of the issues with, uh, unlike the United States, is the indigenous community has suffered from not having access to elite universities until recently. Um, I'm pleased to say that I think all of the G8 now have aggressive programs to bring um, students into courses where you need very high ATARs. So if you want to do law at the G8, uh, you've got to have almost a perfect score. Now the universities are recognising uh, social disadvantage and allowing access to Indigenous students uh, to those courses and, and, uh, and commerce. One of the interesting stats from uh, University of Western Sydney is that Australians support multiculturalism um, by, by a very, very large number. And I guess my experience in, in the workforce has really been through Macquarie and, uh, and my old law firm, Allens. Macquarie, I'm proud to say, is headed by a woman. Uh, she is a Tamil and her family were refugees from that country who came to Australia. And she now, she now is the CEO of that company, which I think is one of the largest companies in the, um, in the uh, Australian Stock Exchange. Um, the, the thing that Macquarie and Allens have in common is that firstly, they, they seek uh, an inclusive and diverse work, workforce, and that they are absolutely committed to excellence. So, the, in my experience, the Macquarie was really like the United Nations. Um, it, it's one of the most, if you go to number 50 Martin Place, Carl, you'll find one of the most diverse, diverse workforces you'll ever see in your life. Um, well, where, now, where does that get us in terms of Kamala Harris? Well, uh, Liz, is, Liz uh, and, uh, and Maureen have pointed out uh, the, the challenge that women in, have to get into leadership and Liz didn't, was modest uh, and didn't mention that she founded the uh, uh, Male Champions of Change, now renamed the Champions of Change. And, and that group has done land really breaking work. We, 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 when flexibility was, was uh, a, a dirty word, uh, that was something that was, was portrayed. We also had the, the leadership role of, of people um, making sure that women could could uh, shine. We had it. We had. We had. We examined bias, conscious and unconscious. The fact that men, as uh, Noreen pointed out, like to appoint people like themselves. Um, so, so the, the companies, a lot of leading companies, firms, and the public service, did some great work in in that in that area. Um, that all having been said, um, I think you, 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 you quoted, most of the material you quoted was listed public companies, and that's a very narrow lens. We've got the public service, the university sector, um, and we've got the non-listed companies where, where uh, there, there are a lot of women uh, doing well. Uh, but you're right, in the public company sector, uh, it's still challenging outside boards. Boards, we've done reasonably well. Um, so addressing the particular point, why, why are there so few uh, Indigenous women, why are there so few Chinese women, Indian women and so on? Well, I think, I think uh, in the case of Indigenous people, they've not had the benefit of access to elite universities uh, and that, that is important if you're going to get, the, um, get access, I think, to, to leadership roles. I think that is being overcome, so I'm, I'm optimistic that that will improve. Certainly Macquarie and Allens have Indigenous programs where Indigenous students are, are welcomed. Uh, the, 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 other, the other area um, is uh, in, in that's a puzzle for me is really the Chinese women. Uh, if you look at the ATARs being achieved uh, in 2020 by Chinese heritage people and, and particularly women, uh, where are they going? Um, and that's something I think we need some research on. I, I don't have the data to explain why, why they're not coming through more strongly. Um, but look, I think the, the climate is favorable. People are, companies wish, wish to promote women. 
uh, I think they probably haven't put a lot of focus on on uh, minority groups of colour and different ethnicity, but I think your, your webinar is a wake up call for us to uh, to give that some attention. Look, thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Kevin, and and some uh, some optimism and hope built in with some uh, realism in those comments, which is which is very welcome. Now, of course, I mean, the, these issues we've been talking about, you know, aren't just about power, privilege, and uh, position. They're also about more tangible material things like uh, income and wealth, as reflected, for example, in the, uh, the, uh, the stubborn gender pay gap, both here and elsewhere. Something that if we look at, Liz kind of alluded to this earlier, if we look at the recent re report by Oxfam, the billionaires of the world are coming out of COVID pretty well off, um, where everyone else uh, inequality is, is widening. Um, uh, so I'll turn to the ad in saying that, you know, it's still the case that on average women earn significantly less than men, as well as have much less uh, superannuation. Um, what do you, Dan, what do you see here as the main issues and how can financial inequality uh, be addressed as part of this overall discussion we're having today? Thanks, Carl. And certainly, um, yeah, the financial impact is pretty significant. So maybe if I start with a couple of the, the facts, just to sort of lay the groundwork and then speak to a couple of the things that I think is really going on, which I think speaks to part of the answer, although I'd say there's no silver, silver bullet to this. So the facts are Certainly here in Australia, there is a pay equity gap between men and women of around 14%. That means we're doing the same job at the same level and earning 14% less. So think about that over the course of a lifetime or a working career, together with the fact that women tend to have lower workforce participation and work more part-time, what that ends up meaning as you head into retirement is a retirement gap of around 40 to 45% between men and women. So it ends up having a hugely consequential impact on quite frankly, the dignity and how people can experience their retirement. So that, that really uh, is, is a really significant concern and probably even more ex exacerbated through COVID as well. I would want to acknowledge that as well. Um, Part of the reasons why, I mean, part of, part of and I'm sure we'll, we'll get more into it, but part of the reasons why you've got this huge gap by the time people get to retirement is the fact that men and women are still today paid differently for doing the same job. So it certainly starts there. But also if you look at a number of the roles women pay, uh, uh, work in, they're often in carer roles that society deems to pay less income for, right? So that is certainly part of it. And also part of it is the part-time taking time out to raise kids, taking time out to look after loved ones that is still born primarily by the woman. So that certainly has significant impact on um, the ability to really build strong um, livelihood, but also for retirement. In terms of the specifics from a superannuation side, I would say in some of the things that we see and really advocate for, and if any of you listening today have the ability to, to have impact on this in your own organisation, firstly, where we see a real gap begin to emerge in people's superannuation balances is it does tend to be around the child rearing age. And so organisations paying superannuation guarantee through paternal paternity leave is a really critical way of balancing things out. Um, so that is a really key one. Uh, when we do seminars, we also encourage women to talk about superannuation equality in terms of trying to make sure that between if you do have a partner, that equal amounts are going into the superannuation. So that's another thing to, to think about. Uh, and then another element where we see another huge gap arise, both in the livelihood, but also what it means for retirement, is often where a marriage may fall apart, for example. And unfortunately, there are still legal loopholes that do not have a complete look through into superannuation assets. 
And so this is another thing that we've advocated for is really closing that legal loophole that there is complete look through into superannuation because often that what that means is that women in a divorce settlement will lose out significantly on the retirement or the superannuation savings. So there's some of the things that we certainly think uh, need to be done. But beyond that, I guess I go back to where I began, which is it does start with uh, how women are paid and the pay equity side. And from that perspective, I think complete transparency. So companies, whether they be public or private, should actually really publish this data as to how, what is the, is there any pay gap and do that at different levels. That transparency and reporting is a great place to start because certainly if I look at our own organisation, we've done a pay equity analysis at every level and there is no pay gap and we have absolutely made sure that there isn't and then we publish that into uh, our, our reports every year so that, that there is transparency to that. So I think that's probably a good place to start on the pay equity side. Look, thanks so, thanks so much, Deanne. And that's very impressive to have uh, removed, uh, removed the pay equity gap. Uh, congratulations. And in a sense, this leads me, uh, Stuart, to the que a question that, I, that I'd like to ask you. I mean, uh, in general, it is still a, a terribly unjust situation that we find ourselves in, both in terms of income and wealth and, and as well in terms of opportunities. But what actually then are the responsibilities of businesses themselves to address this? Uh, Deanne suggested one uh, solution in terms of uh, pay equity. But what other things can you, would you identify as the main initiatives that businesses can take uh, to address these issues? Thanks very much, Carl, and thanks everybody. Let me first acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking to you from, which is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and give my thanks to and acknowledge the, their leaders uh, past and present and the care that they've, they've given this, this land that we have the lucky opportunity to, to work and work and play on with our families. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, whether this is such a complex, knotty issue and we've heard from all these different people and all the different aspects and uh, I think when we face it as business, you've just got to get really focused on what you can do uh, in your place of responsibility. And as a CEO of a business, just like Nikki, you have a great deal of opportunity to make a difference uh, in the organisation that you, that you run. And I think that if, um, if we can do that in those places and tell people those stories, uh, we can, you know, in the words of Gandhi, be the change. So the most important thing for me is before we start having great conversations about changing the world to make sure that we've made the change in the organisations that we, that we run. And I believe that business and business people have that, virtually have that duty to make that change. Um, and I see that in three, I see three, three ways to do that. The first of one is to you got to set up um, the system of the system of equity, and that means you're going to have to really drill down into every system and process within your business. So Deanne talked very powerfully about gender pay equity, and back in 2016, let me tell you, I believe that Lion had the most fair and just value system. That are in any company that I'd work for. And of course, we were paying everybody equally. Of course we were. Except that when I went line by line, roll by roll through the data, guess what? We weren't, right? When we had a 4% pay grab. Um, and just like Deanne, we had to fix that cost of $6 million. We did it straight away and we check every six months that it's not there anymore. That was a huge, powerful message, not just in pay equity, but also in fairness and equity of all people within the organization. And people got the message. And we're on our journey to having a 50-50 organization, 40-20, 40-40-20 in all of the teams. And there were lots of glitches, Carl, in the system, right? Mm. It glitches in the way that we hired people, glitches in the way that 
when when women maybe took a career break, how were that was their salary viewed in that career break, superannuation, all of those kinds of things. The whole there's lots and lots and lots of little settings that needed change. So the first thing you do is you've got to get to those to get to those settings. And that there are more there than you think. And it took a while to get to them. One of our values that we've set up, of course, is is fairness and equity, and that helps us. Um, and it's not just about gender, just in case we uh, to go reflect on the conversation we heard before. Lion is also doing a reconciliation action plan, and we also look at the, the diversity of the organisation in many other ways. But gender is the place where we started, because I think it's the most obvious uh, place. Um, the second thing is you are going to have to intervene to create change, because just changing those settings won't be enough. And by that, I mean, you're going to have to make some pretty deliberate hiring decisions. You're going to have to make sure that there are senior role models for those communities. And um, you're going to have to accelerate the development of your um, female leaders. And that would take female mentoring, but male mentoring as well, because you have to be across both of those. And we're pushing that through and then you have to measure and track and I've got to say that the interventions that we make in some parts of the business are different from the interventions we make in others because there are some even a manufacturing business like ours there are some more stubborn pockets of a lack of diversity than others and you have to weed those out uh, so you are going to have to pre-deliberate and intervene to create change uh, the most stubborn area I think um, and the reason why I, I do enjoy talking to the people here and to the people that are the audience that is listening is the third area is I think there is a big job to do to redefine leadership and educate people. Right? Um, the, I mean, one of the comments that really gets, you know, gets me is when, and I think it got all of us, but it bears repeating is where Donald Trump um, was talking uh, about Hillary Clinton and she said, look, she just, she can't be president. She just doesn't look presidential. And it's this whole um, role modeling of what may, this male view of leadership versus I think a more well-articulated complex view of what a great leader looks like. And I don't think that the United States and Donald Trump um, and those, <laughs> those countries that uh, we talked about before, uh, Elizabeth, um, are on their own. And when we, Tony Abbott has his own comments about male leadership versus female leadership. And we need to educate people that um, there, is a, there is a different, more complex style of leadership that's required. And if ever there was a case, it was last year for that. And I know with a 50-50 with team that I run, the, the, the depth and complexity of leadership that's required to lead those diverse teams and the insight that comes from all those different people and the leaders, the leadership that can be provided. And it's a much more complicated and much harder way of doing things. Um, I think we still need to describe exactly how that works. Uh, I know I've had to change the way I, I lead. I'm still a long way off what I would like to be but I think there is a big re-education in what great leadership look like looks like and for that we need different role models and a different discussion on the education of leadership and that's part of the journey we're also we're also on but I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about that but I you know I'm fundamental believer in in making the change in the businesses that you run so that there's good case studies for the rest of the rest of everyone to learn from thank you so thanks so much, Stuart. That, that was uh, yeah, very helpful, particularly looking from a, a business uh, point of view and also highlighting some terrible examples of, uh, of male leadership, which uh, uh, and the destructiveness of them is, is, is patently obvious. I, Nikki, I'm going to turn to, to you now. Um, now, within organizations themselves, there's a lot of talk about the business case for diversity organizations and businesses should support diversity because if they do so it's going to be much better for them commercially or financially or share price or whatever the case may be um, but there's also a question and the one that's very much been discussed today is the question of justice is it fair and is it right and this question of which is the primary motive here 
Um, uh, do you think, you know, business should be driven by contributing to uh, equality purely based on a justice model? Or do you think there's also a need to, uh, for a profit model? So people are profits, what do you think? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll absolutely take that question up. I'd basically like to um, also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, that we're on, the land of the Eora people, and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, this has been and always will be Aboriginal land. Look, on that question specifically, I think the answer is that both are required. But let's start with equality. That is a basic human right that any individual should be able to make progress irrespective of their gender, where they were born, what socioeconomic background they um, were born into. There should be that opportunity for everybody to be able to move forward and not be penalised by others who have set some sort of glass ceiling on their behalf, consciously or unconsciously. And from a business point of view, you know, we want to be building sustainable businesses that take care of the broadest group of stakeholders in that process. So whether that be um, our team members, whether it be the communities that we're in, our customers, our supplier base, it's that um, doing right um, and being a force for good um, across the impact that you have on the planet, on communities and on business that I think all businesses should be striving for. And the reality is, I think there's very few people that would say we shouldn't have equality in our organisations. But the fact that this question, as you noted at the beginning, has been asked time and time again, talks to this massive say, do gap. I say one thing, but when the rubber hits the road, I do something else. And so when I think about equality in, in business, um, you almost need to deconstruct it a little bit. So what does it mean? I mean, the first thing is that you need to be able to offer an equal opportunity for both women and men to thrive in an organisation. So a somewhat level playing field. And we have to acknowledge then that there are some structural barriers that make that difficult. You know, it could be access to childcare, for example, for a, for a woman coming back into the workforce, but then more so these cultural barriers, these sort of conscious, at times unconscious biases that stop that from happening. Equal pay, we've talked about at length, that still isn't where it needs to be consistently um, in this market and certainly not around the world. But then it's also about equal treatment. So let's say you've got a job, you've been given equal pay, it's that equal treatment um, when you're in an organisation. And sometimes that can change. Um, I'll give you an example. I had a situation where I had a very senior uh, leader say to me at one point in my career, Nikki, you're at a tipping point. You need to decide whether it's your career or your husband's career that's going to take precedent so that we can develop a career development plan on that basis. And I thought, what a ridiculous thing to ask. You would never ask a male colleague a similar question. And the reality is my husband and I have chosen to have dual careers and we help each other in both environments. So that equal treatment on the career journey, I think is really important. And then the last one is equal access to training, to promotion opportunities, to networks. So we need that equality beyond just the pay, but really right through um, a man or a woman's career journey in organisation. But at the end of the day, when we do that, well, does it, is there a business case? Does it yield profits? Definitely. You get the right representation of the people that you serve. You know, when you have the bulk of buyers being women in an FMCG company, you want to make sure they're well represented in the organisation. Um, but you need to double click. So you can have 50-50 representation of women, but I'm always really interested in, is that 50-50 representation at the board level? Is it at the senior management level? Is it in the factories? Is it in um, functions beyond HR and marketing and sitting in finance and supply chain and some of the more STEM-based um, disciplines in an organisation? So that double clicking becomes super important. And that's where I think quotas are interesting and they're important in that you measure what you treasure, but let's measure the right things. So we get not just absolute understanding of equality, but we get quality of equality in an organisation and really sort of understand that more. 
And probably just the last message that I would make, and it goes back to the fundamental question that you asked around equality versus, um, yeah, do you do it for people or do you do it for profit? And I think the reality is right now, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, the single biggest leadership quality that I think is needed today, and we certainly saw it over the course of 2020 when the pandemic hit and continues to impact businesses, communities, governments, is a duality of leadership. The fact that we need to ask, is it people or profit, should not be questions that we're asking anymore. It should be the ability to sit comfortably with the and and. It's about profit and about people. It's about productivity and about well-being. It's about sustainability and positive impact on the environment and affordability. It's about masculine energy and feminine energy. It's about the value that expertise and wisdom can bring to an organisation coupled with a beginner's mindset. And I think once we have that duality in everything we do, then the ability to move from that say to that do gap when it comes to equality is more likely to be there. Well, thanks so much, Nikki. And then also, I mean, interesting reflects a theme that's gone through this, and that's about breaking down kind of strict distinctions between what we might think of as masculine and feminine and all the other kind of distinctions uh, that, that go along with that. And now I'm going to turn now, we've had some questions from the audience. We probably won't be able to get to all of them, but we certainly will uh, address some of them. And there's one interesting question here. That, uh, it was an anonymous attendee who's uh, asked a question we haven't addressed. Um, and this person says, Hi all, what advice can you give young women who wish to succeed and elevate to more senior leadership roles that might not necessarily be welcomed? So what happens if you're not in one of the more progressive organizations that we've heard about today as a young woman and you want to get ahead? Can anyone offer any advice? I'd say Lee, there's plenty of places where you can work, where you will be appreciated. You don't have to work at one of those places. I, I was I, exactly I think... about to say that, Noreen, sorry. Yeah, come yeah. and work for me. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. I mean, great female talent, great talent generally is in big demand. So great female talent even more so. So I'm 100% with Noreen. I mean, you know, I do a number of these cultural reviews. I look at national institutions or big organizations and I go out and talk to women and men about culture. And sometimes I just think, oh my gosh, you know, I just love to say, just get the hell out of here. I can introduce you to a whole lot of organizations which would really value but it is a little bit like when you remain in a culture like that long term, you start to believe that you aren't worth anything, that your talent is not, you know, that you should be devalued. And I, you know, it's easy for us, I suppose, Noreen and I and Nikki and others to say leave. Sometimes because of your financial obligations and everything else, that's not you don't consider in that moment that that's an option for you. At that point in time, I would reach out to other women would be one of my suggestions because totally. women's solidarity and sharing of experiences um, is always useful, particularly in other organisations. But, yeah. but I even think, Liz, oh. I even think if you consider yourself not highly skilled or that your skills aren't valuable, there are always other places to work. Um, and this... The, the particular market at the moment is one where diversity is valued, even um, you know in the most in the most low paid of jobs at some places. And you you can look around and you can think about it. Um, um, Liz, uh, don't, don't ignore that there's a, a bunch of men who would also like to help women in those circumstances. Uh, when you leave the big end of town and go to the small end of town, it's not as rosy a picture as we have all portrayed here today. Um, there is a lot of uh, chauvinism, uh, the view that uh, uh, equality is an interesting idea, but we're in the, in the business for profit and uh, you're going to ruin the business unless we focus entirely on that. So where, where a young woman faces that situation, 
I think uh, someone with some gray hairs can give them some advice on how to manage, but I'd basically be with Noreen. I would, I would quit. And if I just add one extra element, um, and when I saw that come through, I thought, oh, I've, I've been there. And so many of us have been there, right? And, and I've been in an organisation where, and even at this point, I was quite senior, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a crack at really changing the culture and having a positive impact. And day after day, I just felt exhausted. And what I realised is I just didn't fit the values and the culture. I needed something, an organisation that was deeply human, that was really purpose-driven. That's who I am and that, there's my values. And it eroded my soul, if I'm really honest. But I did feel trapped and it was a little bit of like, well, I don't know if I'll get another job. And then one of the best bits of advice I got was just remember, particularly if you're interested in senior roles, there's three things you need to think about. One is credibility. So do your job really well. The second is executive presence and really building that confidence and presence. And then the third, which I had done woefully up to that point, is the importance of connections, network and sponsorship. And from that day on, I actually went about looking at my role and my job of connecting far more in the organisation, in the industry, so that I would not get myself in that point again and reaching out to different people and not being worried. You often have that voice on your shoulder that says, oh, they won't want to have coffee with me or they won't want to meet with me. Well, most people are flattered and love helping people out. And so just having that, that confidence not to listen to that inner voice and to really reach out if you are at that moment, that I learnt the hard way. Thanks, Jen. I'm going to turn to another audience question now, and this is again reflecting on something that we haven't discussed, yet something that's obviously very pertinent in society, if you think of the debates around the Australia Day Awards a few, a few days ago. Um, but the question, and I'll read it, do you think that this conversation needs to include and represent gender fluidity and people who do not wish to identify by their gender? Um, and we can add to that, obviously, people who are uh, who um, would identify as, as transgender. Any thoughts on the fact that, you know, on the one hand, we're talking, we've said in, through this conversation that, that we need to kind of dismantle distinctions between masculinity and femininity, but there are big questions on dismantling the difference biologically, in a sense, uh, as well as with identity between men and women. Any thoughts? Carl, if I can jump in, it's Noreen. I I, in all the years now that I've been talking to people about their workplace problems, and there's, it's a lot of years now, I have never known anyone as discriminated against as trans women. And I think we have a responsibility as feminists to include trans women in our discussions around workplaces, around what happens, I think, as, as people who are taking a progressive position um, when it comes to, to the culture of workplaces, we've got a responsibility to include trans men in diversity discussions. And I think that as you've raised the topic now, it seems to me that this is the identity issue of our time um, for transsexual people and, and our responsibility as, as diversity practitioners is to include them. If I could also maybe just make a comment on this, because we've spent a lot of time today talking about gender um, for obvious reasons. But I, I do think that the being representative of society in our organisations um, is at the heart of what this topic um, is about. It's, it's about recognising that aside from equality, you almost need equality, diversity and inclusion to come together. You can have an incredibly diverse workforce that is not inclusive you can have a very inclusive organisation that is not diverse in its representation. And I almost think the worst thing that can happen is when you have people sitting around a table, a virtual table, looking and looking different, but actually sounding the same and just all, all 
um, confirming each other's point of view as opposed to where the real value lies, which is in harnessing that dynamic tension that comes from diversity of perspective. And that diversity of perspective can only come when we have a truly representative sample of the, um, the melting pot that is society. And I think that needs to be done very deliberately. So whether it's gender or sexual orientation, multiculturalism, disability, um, you know, the list goes on. How do we capture that? Because when we have diversity, equity and inclusion together, then I think you create a culture of belonging. And when people feel like they belong somewhere and they feel safe, then that's when you can unlock creativity, innovation, problem solving, lateral thinking. But people need to feel like they are part of a, a tribe where they have the freedom um, to show up in their authentic way. And I think we're far from that. Yeah, what I, sorry, Nikki. What, what I noticed uh, without being deliberate about this was when we set out on a journey of equality and fairness in general, which is what we were talking about, and inclusion, um, that uh, a lot of the um, conversation we started with gender, but it, it got into ethnicity and then sexual orientation as well. And we supported gay marriage and things like that things like that but actually just having that fundamental setting of equality as represented by fixing gender pay gaps and targets actually and that the whole feeling of psychological safety to talk about it allowed all of those groups to flourish um but we haven't been deliberate about poking at one group or, to, or at another yet do, do you see what i mean you've 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 set a setting and it just and it allowed those conversations to start happening so there probably is more that we could do to for every single group, but the fundamental setting of inclusivity, which I think is what Nikki is talking about, and the psychological safety to have those conversations, allowed that to, to happen. And we've got some very flourishing, self-organised groups now within Lion who've organised themselves into communities because there's that feeling around it. So I think that's the fundamental thing that you you got to get start. As it, it's a great starting point that. Thanks so much, Stuart. Now, the final question I'm going to ask the audience, because we're running out of time. In fact, we're going to go slightly over time. Um, um, and this question is more about the, it's about the structure of work. I'll read it out. What kind of changes can we make to the structure of work to embrace flexibility that is more accommodating to many women who have greater carer responsibilities? Flexible arrangements such as the four-day week, for example, um, uh, how can we promote companies making these changes? And Nikki, we know that Unilever has been uh, doing some very great work on this. And I might add here, obviously, the experience of COVID gave the country the experience of uh, universal paid childcare, um, which made a significant difference to, to, uh, to many people. Um, but so more generally then, what can be done about the structure of work to make it accommodating to, uh, to these different needs? Could I jump in there, Carl, to say that um, uh, I think the, the big issue we're facing at the moment is childcare and early childhood education. Uh, it's completely unsatisfactory. It, it, the education side for four and five-year-olds should be universal and free. And the, the childcare arrangements at the moment are very rigid. They don't suit women in leadership. Women in leadership are going to need nannies and they are not tax deductible, which seems to me completely unfair. Can I just add also, Carl? I mean, it's such a great question because it's almost like God handed us work. Here you are, this is work. Don't mess with it. Well, work is not something handed down from on high. Work is a human construct. We created it. We need to shift it. And that's what I'm loving about one of the positive things that's coming out of COVID is leaders are adopting and organizations are adopting a much more experimental mindset. They're throwing, up some of, throwing out some of the old assumptions they had about work. Firstly, they're starting to understand that work is not where we go, it's what we do. It has infinite number of modalities, but at its core is what we do, which is why purpose-driven organizations, I think, are doing better during this can pandemic than others. But if you were to shift work, um, and we are seeing some great shifts, and I know Nikki's doing amazing things there at Unilever. 
but it's not just about shifting work. We have to shift all the systems that underpin work. Kevin just pointed to childcare. I couldn't agree more. I mean, if you're a police officer or you're a, you know, someone who works out of hours, how are you going to access the existing childcare system in this nation? You're just not. It's set up for people who are working five days a week, nine to five. Um, so that needs to shift. The transport system needs to shift. In the past, you had to buy a weekly transport, you know, ticket or whatever. So if you only work two days a week, you're still compelled to pay five days. I mean, it's those basic systems that also need to shift with the way that work's shifting. So I think at the heart of what we do has to be flexibility, although I would say from, you know, particularly working um, with the global union movement, we have to ensure that those who are um, you know, that every worker is entitled to decent work with proper terms and conditions as well. So that would be my few comments about, about what needs to shift. But I'll hand to Nikki. Well, I mean, just, um, just to pick up on your point, um, Liz, as well, it, it is in our hands, right? There was a time when there was a six-day working week, then it, you know, probably seven days, six day, five day. Um, we, the experimentation piece, I think, is really important. It's, it's, it's absolutely coming at this with a beginner's mindset because in many ways, all of us bring a lot of experience to the table. It can be our biggest strength. It can also be the biggest blind spot because there's a certain way that we've either grown up or believed that leadership or businesses should run and we almost need to deconstruct for ourselves what the new future of work looks like. Some of the really practical things that we're trying, and you know, I say trying because some of it will work and some of it won't, but we've introduced the four day week in New Zealand. We'd, we'll be paying our, um, our team members there 100% of their pay to work 80% of the time, as long as they deliver 100% of the productivity and the impact that we've agreed on. And that means it's forcing team members to reimagine how they can remove those non-value added processes and things that get in the way of allowing them to unleash full potential in a four day week versus a, um, a five day week. But then we're also giving people the freedom to decide how they want to use that. Some of our team members want to be able to take their kids to school and therefore want five mornings a week off. Others would like a day off. Others want the flexibility of picking and choosing based on one cup, what comes up over the course of the week because their partners might do shift work. So I think we also need to treat adults like adults and give them the space and the freedom to, um, to conduct their lives in much more flexible ways. We also introduced this thing called pass the baton. Um, and that was acknowledging that sometimes the primary carer is not a mum. Sometimes it is a dad. Um, sometimes it is somebody else. So giving 16 weeks of paid carers leave when a baby is born to give the flexibility for a dad to spend that time with his newborn. But at the same time, it gives his partner, the mum, the opportunity to come back to work earlier if that's also what she wants to do. So, and then we're also looking at things like um, really just deconstructing roles. At the moment, we create roles in our business based on a five day a week logic, but actually they might be better off served if we had a, two jobs, one that's three days a week based on certain deliverables and one that's two days a week based on certain deliverables. And when we do that well, we open ourselves up to a talent pool of uh, amazing people that otherwise would not be able to participate in our organisation if we were very rigid about the employment contract that we have. So I think um, a healthy dose of creativity is needed and, um, and a bucket load of courage because sometimes we, we don't know what we don't know and sometimes it won't work. But there will always be great lessons learned that we can take forward into the next experiment. Well, thanks so much, Nikki. I'm going to bring the, this uh, the discussion to a close now. But really, thank you for, for all of you uh, panelists for taking the time out of, your, out of your very busy schedules to join us today and to contribute uh, to this uh, in, in important discussion. I know I've certainly uh, uh, learned a lot, and I certainly hope as well this has been of value um, to the people who've tuned in. To the audience, thank you very much too. Um, and on behalf of UTS Business School uh, for joining us uh, today. As we've said before, this, uh, this webinar will be available, a uh, recorded version subsequent. Um, uh, so um, we hope to uh, get more coverage through that as well. 
But I think as a very closing comment, um, I'm actually going to uh, steal some of Liz's words because I think it's the appropriate way to think of this. We created it, we need to shift it. And I think on behalf of all of us, I think that's a good message. This discussion is hopefully made a small uh, contribution uh, to that shift, but certainly um, uh, changes that are absolutely um, uh, required if we are going to realize the, uh, the promise of uh, a just economy for everybody in Australia and in the world. Thank you very much.